Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and um, get started. And I want to share with you, as I said before this morning, um, we are looking at Ephesians chapter four, verses uh, 17 through 19. But I want to segue uh, into a discussion of the George Floyd uh, incident. Uh, and I, I think my, for our purposes, the goal really is to understand what a biblical response to it should be. Uh, there are a lot of people responding. There are a lot of things happening, a lot of things being said from the White House to the outhouse, as they say. Everybody's reigning in, celebrity and non-celebrity, a lot of anger and angst, resentment, bitterness, et cetera. Uh, and I think as followers of Christ, our response is very, very important and instructive. And, and of course, in all things that we do, the goal is to be biblical. So a biblical response to the George Floyd situation is what I want to talk about. <clears throat> the passage that I would like for us to consider, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19, uh, which where Paul says, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you no longer walk, just as the Gentiles also walk, Gentiles here being those who are not followers of Christ, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But he goes on to say at the beginning of verse 20, but you did not learn Christ in this way. And I think Paul's statement there, there ought to be a qualitative difference between the speech, the acts, and the responses of those who are followers of Christ in every situation than those who do not evidence a life of following Christ. And so I want us to just consider these things uh, going forward this morning. Father, we're grateful uh, for your goodnesses to us. We're grateful for the love that you have for us. And uh, Father, even as we consider uh, your word, which of course is the heavy in our lives and the determiner of what is proper and fitting and directive uh, uh, for us. Uh, Father, we would ask for your wisdom in understanding what it is you would have us to do and say and how you would have us respond. And uh, Father, uh, grant us the understanding to be biblical in our approach to all things. And Father, especially at this time, when so many things are being said and done, uh, grace us, uh, strengthen us, enable us uh, to show forth your praises. And uh, we pray that the mind of Christ will guide us in understanding as well as in application. We ask always by Satan that your word uh, would have free course. As always, Father, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the thanksgiving. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, as we think about uh, this particular situation, I'm reminded of uh, one of the favorite shows that I had for a while, and that is uh, Criminal Minds. Uh, Criminal Minds was, uh, I thought it was a dangerous show <laughs> uh, because it portrayed a lot of people doing a lot of really weird, dastardly things. And I thought, well, you know, people are going to traffic in that. And uh, they're, they're going to try to imitate a lot of what they see. Uh, however, um, as it turns out, uh, there was a lot of good in that show in that as they track the unsub, that is the unknown uh, subject <clears throat> of their investigation, uh, what they tried to do was uh, figure out uh, the mindset of the individual, uh, why they did what they did, how uh, they thought, their particular habit patterns, et cetera. And as they pieced together a, a visual, virtual portrait of this individual, then they were able to figure out where they would be and uh, what uh, they would be thinking. And so they were able to eventually track them down, which they did each and every episode. 
And I, I think the, the reason I, I really like the show is because it shows how uh, there is a direct correlation between the way that people think and the way that people act. <clears throat> in, in reading um, uh, the commentary on Ephesians from uh, Dr. John MacArthur, he references something that I write, like to read to you. He says in the two volume book, The Criminal Personality, Samuel Yokelson and Stanton Samenow maintain that criminal behavior is the result of warped thinking. <clears throat> Three entire sections are devoting to, devoted to the thinking errors of the criminal. By studying what criminals think rather than trying to probe their feelings and backgrounds, these researchers use these sections to share their conclusions, and it is this. It is remarkable, they write, that the criminal often derives as great an impact from his activities during non-arrestable phases as he does from crime. The criminal's thinking patterns operate everywhere. They are not restricted to crime. And that's a description, Paul, Paul uh, Dr. MacArthur says, of, of a depraved reprobate mind. That is uh, the mind that Paul <clears throat> is describing in this particular section. But the authors go on to say sociological explanations have been unsatisfactory. The idea that a man becomes a criminal because he is corrupted by his environment has proved to be too weak an explanation. We've indicated <clears throat> that criminals come from a broad spectrum of homes, both disadvantaged and privileged within the same neighborhood. Some are violators and most are not. It is not the environment that turns a man into a criminal. It is a series of choices that he makes starting at a very early age. The researchers conclude that the criminal mind eventually will decide that everything is worthless. His thinking is illogical. <clears throat> and I, I find that instructive as, as we think about uh, why these kinds of reprehensible things happen. How is it that a man <clears throat> or men tasked with protecting and serving would actually uh, perpetrate the kind of crime that would result in the death of, an, of a victim? And uh, I think a lot of it uh, forces us to consider that there is a mindset out there. The Bible describes that mindset here in these verses. And the thing is, the chair that people like that sit in uh, you know, chairs have four uh, legs, and each leg is, uh, as we think about what Paul says here, each leg, there are four different things that Paul mentions here that describe the mind, the thinking of the person who uh, is seeking to live their life apart from God and apart from his grace. And as we consider that individual, those individuals, <clears throat> what we see is that there isn't a lot of difference between where they are and where we once were. <clears throat> and I think we ought to remember that as we consider our responses. <clears throat> so let's, let's delve into uh, what, what God says about the mind of those who seek to live their life apart from his grace. First of all, uh, he says that uh, they walk in the futility of their mind, the futility of their mind. Uh, the word futility there, obviously, is a word that speaks of emptiness, and uh, it's described as vanity uh, by Solomon Ecclesiastes. And, and the, the idea behind the word is, is that kind of short-term, very selfish thinking um, that uh, all of us are familiar with. We come into the world uh, with our minds set on ourselves and what we want, what we desire, uh, what we care about and are interested in. And of course, the enemy of our souls has designed an entire world system that feeds into and caters to those appetites and desires and whims. And so then we gravitate toward that which is inappropriate <clears throat> in the sight of God. And because of that short-term thinking, we pursue things that in the long run don't really satisfy. Uh, you know, 
the Bible says that sin is, is um, overstepping the boundaries. And, uh, you know, those of us who have raised children, uh, we understand the importance of boundaries. We know that uh, kids push against boundaries uh, by nature. You don't have to teach a child uh, to uh, resist authority, but you have to carefully instruct them in the importance of authority and to teach them that, listen, rules are in place not to, to, to limit your freedom, but actually to grant you freedom. The child needs to understand that when you have rules, then, you know, you can walk under those rules. Or you can stay within the boundaries that are established. And as a result, uh, you demonstrate a responsibility. And with responsibility comes trust. And with trust comes freedom. So the rules are just a way uh, for an individual to demonstrate responsibility so that they have maximum freedom. The person who doesn't see it that way because they're so selfishly engrossed, they push naturally against the freedoms, uh, against the boundaries, against the rules, and as a result, then they lose their freedom. And as parents, we understand that you have to shape that in the child early on because that's going to be the thing that, that carries them the rest of their life. They are always going to have rules. Some they'll like, some they don't like, but they're always going to have to learn how to operate under the authority that God has raised up. And to the degree that they're able to submit to that degree, then they are able to have freedom. And so it's, it's a beneficial thing to have rules. It, and of course, for our understanding, the police officers uh, are civil servants tasked by God with helping the society keep the rules. Uh, it's just that, of course, the individual uh, who is tasked with helping people keep the rules you know, from the same stock. They also have that very selfish bent. They also have a nature that is bent toward doing that which they like or which they find beneficial. And apart from the grace that helps them learn to value and appreciate being real civil servants, then what they can do is when they receive a little bit of power, a little bit of authority, having that selfish nature, then they think short term as children do, Children think about what now, or what do I like, what do I want? They don't learn how to self-abnegate, uh, to delay what they want for the benefit of others and for their own eventual benefit. They think very now-ish, if that's not a term, but you know what I mean. And, and because of that, uh, when they have power, it's very easy for an individual with power and authority with a very selfish, vain approach um, to, to use that. Um, and of course, I mean, the hypocrisy of that is very apparent when you have an individual uh, who has been tasked with helping keep order in society and that individual then begins to break the very rules that they are, are tasked with establishing and maintaining, uh, then of course it stands out all the more. And this is what we see. Well, we have to understand that, of course, all of us have that selfish tendency. And apart from the grace of God in Christ Jesus, that has set us free from a selfish pursuit because God's love is in us and the love of God is other focused so that we naturally learn to care about other people and to serve. Uh, apart from that, then selfishness does take over and people who are selfish and have power can abuse that privilege. So again, Paul, Paul describes one leg of the mind of the person apart from Christ as one of futility <clears throat> in, their, in their minds. A second thing he says in verse 18 is that they are darkened in their understanding, darkened. And of course, uh, the, the word for understanding is the word from which we get our word diagnosis. Uh, you know, as I mentioned with criminal minds, as they are able 
to diagnose, piece together in bits of information about the unsub so that they form a picture in their minds of what the individual thinks and, and how they operate and want so that they can track the behavior and catch them. Uh, in the same way that a doctor is able to look at your blood pressure, uh, your skin tone, they're able to listen to your heart and your lungs and et cetera, and they do these things to diagnose an accurate picture of what's going on on the inside of your body and your health. In the same way, uh, God has given us the ability to understand life. We can understand our purpose. And of course, to understand the purpose in life, you have to really know the giver of life. So the person who doesn't know the giver of life isn't really in a position to accurately assess their purpose in life. As we said before, uh, the two most important days in your life are number one, the day you're born, and number two, the day you understand why you're here. Uh, if you understand your purpose, then you can, you can live out that purpose and have that fulfillment. And Jesus offers us, does he not? He offers us meaning and purpose. We know why we're here. We know why God brought us here. We know what God has given us to do. We know where we're going when we leave here. We have the most important questions answered already. But the person who doesn't have a relationship with Christ, the person who's looking to create their own meaning apart from the God who has assigned the meaning, well, in their selfishness, Paul says their understanding, their ability to figure out what's really important in life, to understand the purpose, that that is darkened. And so they really can't make a lot of sense of what life is all about. And because they can't make a lot of sense of what life is all about, then they're not really able to pursue the best courses in life. You can uh, readily understand how that operates. Uh, people do what they want to do. They pursue their own self-interests. You know, I found it uh, interesting that even in our society, we, we shut down the entire country uh, because we wanted to rein in uh, this coronavirus, this COVID-19. Uh, we, we had determined that it is in the best interest of everyone in our country to be uh, socially distant and to be guarded with masks and facial gear, et cetera. <clears throat> and the government has even determined that some uh, um, Businesses are not essential and don't even need to be in operation. They shut all of this down in an attempt uh, to figure out how to arrest this and said it was for the best interest of the nation. However, you consider things like um, the abortion industry. You consider how that millions of innocent preborn children have been put to death. You would think that the country would determine that it is in the best interest of those who are coming into the world that we safeguard them. But no, we allow abortion to continue, to take the lives of the innocent. Uh, you would think that we would say, okay, any, um, any type of lifestyle that brings danger to the community would be abandoned or would be negated, such as the incursion of AIDS, which in its outset was predominantly in the homosexual community. You would think that our society would say, no, 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 that lifestyle represents a danger to the country, to the community, that, and that we would decry that, but no. On the other hand, they are fast promoting and pushing and developing drugs to fight the results of an aberrant lifestyle um, rather than recognize the danger of the lifestyle. So see, the understanding is darkened uh, because they, they really don't want to know what's in the best interest of the ones that are different from them. They, don't want a moral approach. They don't want a biblical approach to life. And so 
Well, of course, the inconsistency and the lack of uh, well, straightforward thinking is just very apparent to those of us who value life. Well, you can imagine that the individual uh, who makes those kinds of, of determinations, I mean, we, we can understand because, you know, in our lives, we've made decisions, haven't we? that weren't the best decisions. We make decisions all the time. We say, well, I, this isn't right to do, right? But we do it anyway. Uh, you know, we can say, well, I, I know I don't have the money <clears throat> and I know that the borrower is a slave to the lender. I know, I know, I know. But we can still make choices that bring dire consequences, even though we know that it's not in our best interest. So we understand that process of having our understanding halted so that we could pursue the thing that we want. The difference is though, that the individuals who have been tasked with reining in the excesses so that society is safe and protected, those individuals are from the same stock as we are, right? Uh, they came into the world just like we did. Uh, uh, debased in their thinking and darkened in their understanding and selfish in their orientation. And when you take an individual selfish without understanding their true purpose and not really necessarily embracing that servanthood that comes from being public servants, uh, not seeing that their calling is to protect and honor and maintain citizens and the lives if, if they don't see that purpose in a noble way, then the selfishness and the darkened understanding is such that they can actually abuse the very ones that they are tasked with um, protecting and safeguarding. And this, this is what happened, uh, these individuals. And the thing is, not, not every police officer, obviously. In fact, I would say most of the police officers, I have some friends with police officers, and the ones that I know and love and cherish and respect and, and really appreciate, you know, I, I like what they do. And I tell you, I appreciate their willingness to put their lives on the line and to, to live out the purpose of safeguarding my freedoms and liberties. And that is not an easy task. <clears throat> and when you have some, not all, but some who misrepresent in an abrasive way, all of them, uh, then of course, they all get painted with the same broad stroke. And so then um, the four police officers who were fired were responsible, well, not directly, but indirectly, because their actions unleashed a, a torrent of resentment that resulted in well, the death of a police officer in a, whole, in a different state, uh, the, the setting of fire of the police precinct in their own town, all of these demonstrations and, and people reining in and people angry. And I don't think when they got up that morning that they determined that today I'm going to precipitate anarchy in our society, but not thinking about the consequences of their actions and being darkened in their understanding and not actually adopting the purposes for which they have been tasked uh, brought about uh, all of those consequences. Uh, being darkened in your understanding, not knowing why God has brought you here, not being able to, to ascertain what your true calling is so that you live it out, can result in you abusing other people. And that is what we have seen. A uh, third leg, besides futility and darkened understanding, Paul says that they are excluded from the life of God, excluded from the life of God. The person uh, who does not know God, obviously doesn't have the life of God. And as we talked about even earlier today uh, in our Sunday school about uh, living out uh, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, God's life in us produces a love, which is other focus and a joy and a, and a peace and, and a, a patience and a gentleness and a kindness and a faithfulness and a goodness. You know, <clears throat> these things are produced in us by God himself. But the person who does not know God is not able to consistently manifest that kind of activity. 
that kind of character. They are excluded from the life of God. The person who lacks the love of God can come into a community that is not their community and not, not really care. You know, Bob Beal uh, talks about, uh, <laughs> he has a little thing on how to, how to fire uh, an employee in a Christian way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I found as, as I thought about that, that is applicable not just for employees, not just for churches, uh, but even for child rearing. You know, there uh, he talks about beginning with care. And if you care for someone, then of course you have to be honest with them in assessing where they are. And it wouldn't be fair to allow them to continue in ways that are inconsistent with their calling, inconsistent with that which will benefit them in the, them in the long run. And even when pointing out their strengths, which you should do, uh, you have to at least point to the activities and ways that present stress. And so I, I like that analogy, but I like the fact that it begins with care. And, you know, the person who does not have the love of God in their heart, uh, who doesn't really know Christ in the forgiveness and pardoning of their sins, uh, that person isn't always loving, right? I mean, those of us who know Christ, there are times when uh, we resist the call of God to walk in love because some people we don't like, some people we don't want to be with. Some uh, times things happen and we don't even want to respond in a way that brings glory to Christ. But the person who doesn't know Christ uh, doesn't have that love abiding in them. And, and as such, uh, they can do a lot of things without caring. Um, this person uh, without the life of God can actually go into a neighborhood. And when people are already under stress, and they may not really, really be able to think about the fact because Paul says they're ignorant. They don't know that, you know, the, the tensions are high in the community because, you know, COVID-19 has disproportionately affected a lot of people in certain neighborhoods. Because a lot of people, particularly in, in our ethnic group's neighborhood and others, uh, you know, most of the people there work in service industry. And uh, when the governor deems that these industries are non-essential and they shut down, uh, these individuals aren't able to work from home. So they, are, they go from income to no income immediately, but they still have bills and, and the stress level because they still have mouths to feed children, et cetera, and if you are someone tasked with maintaining the peace and people are on edge, and then they, they may say something. They may do something. And without, without caring, without the understanding, and listen, they're under stress. Uh, listen, they, they've got these issues going on. Then there's no, there's no sympathy. There's no empathy. Uh, there's only a disdain. And, you know, you can, if you've got power and authority, you can come down very hard, very forcefully. And in an instance where there is the uneven application of justice, such that if you're a 21-year-old and you shoot up in a church, an AME church, and you kill nine people, you get arrested, taken into custody of lives, and they stop and get you uh, food because you're hungry and take care of you. And then you have a trial where you evidence zero remorse for the things that you've done. You know, that, that, that is one picture. But on the other side, if you're George Floyd, who from the owner's perspective and appearance didn't even realize that the, the dollar bill, the, the 20 that he gave was a forgery. He, he didn't, because he's sitting on his car right outside of the business establishment. He's not aware. But why it takes four officers to accost him about that, I, I don't know. But then the next thing you know, um, he's dead. You know, over, what, 20 bucks? And someone who has killed nine, taken nine lives and destroyed families and extended families uh, does not die. And see, these things play on the mind. And these things shake the heart. And so people, people get angry and people get tired and people get resentful. But you know, the, the officers who 
are insensitive, some of them, not all of them, but the ones who don't think about the impact of their actions on the community, you know, they, they can put a blight on everyone. Um, I, I put down in my notes um, how that sometimes because of ignorance and they don't have God's peace in their hearts, uh, they can go into community and the first thing they feel is fear. Um, I, I mentioned before how I was uh, pulling out of um, the, the mother church that started, gave birth to our church and pulled over by a police officer. And of course, as I sat there, he abruptly yelled for me to get out of the car and he had me put my hands on the, on the hood and patted me down and all of this stuff, put me in the backseat of his car while he ran my driver's license and my tags and all of this. And as we talk, why, it, you know, is that even happening? He said, well, I thought that you were reaching for a gun or something under your seat. I'm like, well, I'm just sitting back with my hands in my lap because you told me to, to stay here. Uh, but, you know, in a different setting, he might have shot first and asked questions later and said, well, I thought he was making a move. See, it, it, the fear. You, you know, I noticed that none of the African-American men uh, that I've seen who were killed, none of them were little scrawny guys. They were all a well-built, stocky, strong uh, men. And for some reason, in the eyes of the perpetrators of these acts, they represent danger. Um, and out of fear, instead of love, then you ate, you act. And if you have authority and power, you can act with impunity and you can bring a lot of harm. And, and that's, that's what we saw. You know, I think um, people can be uh, insensitive and not thinking, and then their actions um, bring about uh, a lot of angst. Um, I chuckle when I think about the fact that when I was in pharmacy school, um, well, I graduated actually, I was out practicing pharmacy in Atlanta and, um, you know, people would come in to get their blood pressure medication and they would say their blood pressure is high. And, and if they were an African-American male, I would say, look, when do you take your blood pressure? You know, only take your blood pressure in the day. Don't ever take your blood pressure at night. And um, they would look at me and I say, well, you do understand that for some reason, psychologists have come to understand that an African-American male, his blood pressure goes up as the night comes on and then it goes back down in the morning so if you take your blood pressure in the day it will i mean in the evening it'll always register higher than it really is so take it in the day and that was true even years after a lot of things in the 70s and 80s changed um, but it was just one of those things that you know if you're ignorant of that then you know, you would think, well, man, this guy can't get his blood pressure under control, and you will over-medicate uh, someone for no reason. Um, ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance opens up people for abuse. And, um, you know, Paul says the ignorance that is in them, and he speaks of the hardness of their hearts. That, that word speaks about a process that happens, you know, when a uh, a bone is broken, uh, there is a calcification that sets in. And many times it can get to the point where the tendons become immobile uh, to the point of, of being paralyzed. And so that word there came to speak of a, a kind of paralysis, a rock hard setting that sets into the joints. And then he uses it to speak of hearts that are hard-hearted, a person selfishly oriented, a person living a life apart from the life of God without the grace of God can do some really hard and sensitive things. And of course, we can be angry about that, but you have to remember that the person who does those hard, mean, spirited things is from the same stock that you and I are from. You know, we're all, we're born in sin. And the difference in us is that God has graced us. He set us free from a lot of habit patterns and ways that they are not free from. 
And so then as we see these things carried out, I, I tell you, because I, I realize that there are a number of really wonderful police officers. And the way that they put their lives on the line, it can't be easy. In fact, uh, the ones that I know and pray for, you know, I'm praying for them because, you know, they, they leave home every morning and there are no guarantees that they'll even come back at night. And as I'm praying for them and for their safety and for their families and their children, I mean, there's a lot at stake, but they're willing to risk it for our sake. And I tell you, I appreciate their sacrifice and their willingness to do those kinds of things. I would not want that job, but I'm really grateful for those who embrace that calling to be civil servants. And the unfortunate thing is that when you have those who with criminal intent, uh, because their thinking patterns are jaded because they've gotten to a point where they are hard hearted as a result of consistently searing their conscience and rejecting their conscience <clears throat> so that they don't even feel any guilt anymore. Um, then they can do a lot of damage because they have opportunity to do so. And it's an unfortunate, unfortunate thing. The fourth and final thing that, that Paul mentions, he speaks of a callousness. Uh, in the King James, it says they're past the feeling. <clears throat> uh, this, this word describes uh, someone who does not feel any pain. In fact, the, the word there is the word from which we get our term analgesic. Analgesic, <clears throat> that which actually takes away pain, it numbs. And these individuals, have become so numbed in their feelings that uh, they are able to do things with impunity. You know, I, when the, the Ku Klux Klan was uh, out and about in the early years, uh, you know, they wore sheets, uh, masks over their faces because they didn't want people to know their identity because there was a shame and a guilt that would sit in uh, if, if they were discovered. But you know, as you follow uh, the roots and the outcomes of Arianism, uh, there are these skinheads. Now, they have no feeling. They're able to take a life with impunity like Roof did and feel absolutely nothing. They are past feeling, no remorse. And some of the individuals who have reached that point uh, for, unfortunately, are in the police department. And those individuals uh, bring shame and dishonor to all of the law enforcement efforts that we see. As a result, people don't trust police. And that's very unfortunate because most of them are not like that. Some of them are. Uh, the fact that you can operate uh, without the grace of God uh, moving in you and causing you to care about people, if you can put your knee on the neck of a man for almost nine minutes until his life slowly, slowly is drained from him and have no remorse. I, I don't recall reading that either of those police officers, not COVID who perpetrated the crime, not the other three that stood by and watched and did nothing to intervene, I, you know, the fact that, that you don't feel any remorse, and I don't remember hearing any of them saying, I'm sorry for what I did. I wish we had not done that. And, you know, that callousness, Paul says that the end result of people who have lost touch with their consciences, you know, <clears throat> for all of us, uh, you know, apart from the grace of God, I mean, there we go, right? Uh, we feel nothing. And we can do things that we know aren't right before God, but well, we do them anyway. And we justify our doing them in spite of the fact that we know the scriptures teach that they are wrong. Um, so, uh, you know, the police officers, they are cut from the same stock as we are. Now, now you say, Pastor Ray, are you trying to justify what these men have done? Not at all. Not at all. But I think the, the understanding of the fact that the grace of God and his mercy 
is the difference maker. Apart from God's intervention, uh, that's, that's us. Uh, you and I both have had times where we were angry and could do some things that brought a great deal of harm. God kept us from that. But what if God had not kept us? What if God had not sent Abigail to intercede and David had taken the life of Nabal? You know, how much guilt would he have had the rest of his life? Uh, you know, God is the one that intervenes. So having said that, let me, let me just wrap this up. How do we respond? What's the correct biblical response to issues like this as well as this issue? Let me just mention uh, just a four quick things, four quick things, right? Uh, I, I reference uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30. Uh, here is the instance where David uh, and his men, they're out in uh, Philistine country, uh, raiding the Philistines and killing people. And, um, you know, uh, as they are out and about, they come back and the Amalekites have come in, have uh, burned their city down, Ziklag, and have taken their wives and their children and everything, taken them all captive. And so these men come back and they, they see everything that they have, everything that they've worked so hard for, all of their possessions are suddenly gone, stolen, taken from them. And, you know, then they, they were angry. I mean, at first, they said, you know, stone that David. We're following him all over his, his crazy stuff. We lost our family. Uh, but, you know, in the end, there are four things that happen here that I think would be appropriate for us. The first thing is that they, they, they were grieved. <clears throat> they all cried and wailed, and uh, they lamented the loss. And I think that's an appropriate response. I, I think, in fact, I said to my family last night during our, our hangout meeting, uh, I said, guys, you know, uh, if, if you can face an issue like this and not grieve and, and not hurt, I mean, when you think about the families that were affected, you think about the damage that is done, uh, and you think about the life of this man just snuffed out and termed, deemed insignificant by those with power. I mean, that, that breaks the heart. And, and the thing is, it's not, it's not them, it's, it's us. Because this, 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 is, this is our community, this is our city, this is our state, this is our nation. We're, we're one nation under God. And so what affects, as Dr. King says, injustice anywhere is a threat, what? To justice everywhere. Right. And, and because we're all in this together, then it ought to affect all of us because it surely does affect all of us. And so it was understandable that they grieved over the loss. But listen, we ought to grieve in a reasonable way. Uh, we ought not to get crazy and set things on fire or attack people with impunity. Uh, we ought not. We ought to be restrained even in our grief. Grief is not a license to do harm to others. It never is. But at the same time, as we grieve, uh, we ought not to be silent. Uh, and I appreciate um, uh, the, the um, e uh, what do you call it? Facebook uh, post going around where uh, Phillips has put um, all of these verses that deal with God's mandate of justice <clears throat> and, and as has been shared and reposted over and over, God does care a lot about the administration of justice. And we ought not to be silent and turn our heads and ignore it. You know, maybe, I mean, there's not a lot of good that comes from tragedy. But, you know, one good thing that I think will come out of this is that there is, there is a growing awareness, I think more so than before, on the part of those in the majority culture uh, about the, the inconsistency and the hostility of those with power uh, to abuse those who are without power. Um, the majority culture doesn't always have the same sense of of uh, protest and resentment, <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I 
pray for my son as he goes out in the evening, uh, Lord. Help him to come back safe. People in the majority culture don't always have that concern for the same reason. Because as, as wonderful, as innocent as our kids are, I mean, they're not saying, I mean, they're not um, innocent because we're all sinners by nature and by choice. But of course, they have been raised, you know, by God's grace uh, to be nonviolent, um, submissive citizens of our nation, seeking the good of others and, and caring. But the thought that someone with power could treat them with disdain and um, snuff out their life. And there is very little censure. Uh, that's, that's an abiding concern of mine because this is the culture in which we live. And I think there is a growing awareness of that inconsistency and the fact that this is really one nation and there ought to be equity. So anyway, grieving. The second thing though, uh, that David and his folks did was a the, the process. David, uh, after they talked of stoning him, you know what, he, he says that he encouraged himself in the Lord. What he did is instead of looking at the circumstance of being angry or defending himself or whatever, uh, he thought his thoughts turned upward to the God who is over everything. God is the one in control. And because God is the one in control, then he's the one to whom I appeal, which led to the third thing, and that was prayer. He sought the priest and the ephod, and he asked God for direction. And I think that's, that's a very, very important thing for us. We need, to, we need to pray. Pray for the peace of our nation. Pray for the wisdom on the part of those who lead us. I pray for our police officers and civil servants who put their lives on the line. Uh, some of them really, really wonderful. Pray that, that they'll begin to police themselves because I think police officers probably know who the bad seeds are, but they may not always speak out uh, because there might be that internal peer pressure to conform and allow things to happen. <clears throat> but pray that they will be rooted out and that they'll be a safety and a concern and a compassion, and that they'll see themselves as co-citizens and not above the law or above the people that they are tasked with serving. And so we have a lot to pray for. I appreciate uh, uh, Rachel Peary putting the post up with the pictures of the people uh, in the, the community who have lost their lives at the hands of uh, those who were police and those who were vigilante and, um, you know, asking, uh, first of all, that we pray for those families. And that's a wonderful thing. Uh, pray for the Floyd family. Pray for all those affected by it. Pray for these officers' families. Pray for healing in our nation. I think the tragedies always force us or should to seek God and to pray. And then, of course, the last thing is that we need to preach. We need to preach. <clears throat> the only way to change wicked hearts is to preach the gospel of Christ. People need Jesus to save them from their sin and their selfishness. They need the Lord to intervene and replace the selfish, hateful, mean-spirited tendencies with his love and his mercy, his compassion, with his life. <clears throat> Things like this cause us to recognize the urgency of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, I read a story about a young man in Greek society. <clears throat> this young man has stolen a fox from a guy's uh, yard, but then he happened upon the man. And so he stuffed the fox inside his shirt. <clears throat> but then as he sat there still, um, the fox began to tear at him on the inside. <clears throat> and he stood there still, rather than admit that he had stolen, you know, he allowed the fox to tear at his organs and eventually it cost him his life. And, you know, whether, I don't know if that's a true story or whether it was contrived by the Greeks, <clears throat> but it illustrates the fact that sometimes we are very, very selfish 
and proud in our orientation, too proud to admit that we are wrong and to our own hurt and damage. And I think as a nation, uh, we need to face that. I think as people, we need to face that. I think as individuals, we need to face that. We need God's love and his mercy and his compassion. <clears throat> and we need to humble ourselves and admit that he is the only one that can bring peace to this situation. Father, thank you again for your goodnesses. Thank you for your love and your mercy. And uh, Father, even as we consider um, this unfortunate, the tragic circumstance that has occurred, Father, we recognize that apart from your grace, your mercy, your salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, people left to themselves can do the most dastardly of deeds. People need salvation through Christ. And Father, as we uh, see these things unfold, rather than grow in resentment, may we grow in grace and have a, a willingness to love and to share Christ, the only solution to all of these things. And uh, Father, allow us, uh, as a result of these kinds of tragedies, even as a nation, to recognize the inequities and to seek genuine, um, balanced, true justice. Uh, Father, thank you. Uh, for that. And uh, we just commit to you our responses in our speech, in our acts, in our responses. May they glorify you. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.